talking about cats. What are you talking about? All right, everybody. Welcome to uh, TJ's Cycle. Uh, we are here. Just pulled in off the highway, uh, I-35. Uh, I could zoom that up, I guess, but I'm not going to. We'll see it inside. That's even better. TJ's Cycle, Austin, Texas. KTM, Husk. Work or white performance. What is that? WP, I always forget. People are going to flame me for that. All right. Kimco. Hey, they sell Kimco here, too. Awesome. Svartfilin. 94 degrees. Yeah, I didn't record my... Uh, my weather report. It's going to be a hot one. Smart feeling. Nice. Toys, toys, toys everywhere and enter here. And Kevin, Bikes and Pizza, came to uh, meet for this. All right, walking in. First time, never been here. Ooh, they got a lot of KTMs. This is a serious KTM shop, man. Nice. Nice. <laughs> That's crazy. That's a thousand bucks more than the bike that I'm walking out of here with. And it's a Deut bike. And this looks like mine right here. I think this is mine. This is mine. Yes, indeed. No uh, temp tag on it yet. We're going to go take care of the paperwork. I'm trying to get the camera far enough away here that it gets to see everything. That's the guy. That's mine. And they got it sitting on the... Uh, the ready uh, to ready to ride, ready to road pad. Nice. This is the color that I wanted. This is the dapper gray. Uh, the ash is more of a silver color, but I didn't really care for the turquoise stripes and stuff that were on that tank. I think they would have gotten on my nerves after a while. Uh, this is a little bit more neutral, and uh, I like the red accents on the wheels, the tank, the side, and all that. Uh, and in typical quasi fashion I've already ordered a whole bunch of accessories for this thing uh, they're coming in from India over the next couple of weeks so I got seat and uh, everything you can think of from the Royal Enfield catalog already coming in so anyway I'm gonna go find the guys sit on it. Uh, oh yeah might as well so here it is it's already sold yeah dapper gray and I'm wearing my sh tennis shoes right now so don't flame me for my shoes I'm putting my boots on before I go nice he likey. Oh, first power on. I'm not going to start it in the showroom. 7.1 miles. We got to get a close up of that. So it's had it's had a, a few runs around the parking lot for the PDI check and whatnot. But he said this is not a demo. He said it's going to have a handful of miles on it. So that's all right. I don't mind a few miles as long as they didn't bounce it off the rev limiter for those seven miles. Nice. Yep, I like the feel of the bike. It's very nice low weight, very low center of gravity, light, and yeah. all right, I'm going to go take care of the paperwork. Be likey. This is going to ride 150 miles home, so let's see what else they've got in here. They've got all kinds of cool stuff. Oh, Benelli's, these are cool. Little TNT, 3499. There's some kind of announcement they're going to be making in about a week or two. I don't know what it is. Benelli? Ah, I'm actually interested in trying one out. The little TNT, uh, one of these made it through the cannonball. So, I'm impressed. That's, have, that's um, not a small feat. A lot of here. Cool. I find it too heavy. Yeah, they're a little heavy. Same and with these, uh, the Continentals and stuff. They're just a the, little heavy. The Meteors, mm -hmm. and they're going to come out with a Super Meteor. The Super 650. Meteor 650 is coming, that's right. I, I like these but they're very heavy for what they yes. are. Uh, that just, I mean, look at the size of that crankcase on that thing. It's just, yeah, it's just half the weight of my bike probably. I mean, oh. yeah, yeah, they are heavy, heavy bikes. Meteors are nice. I was actually looking at the Meteors, but uh, I don't know that uh, when the Hunter came out, I just, something about that speaks to me. The more standard style bike, uh, I didn't really want another cruiser, you know, bobber because I've already got the rebel so all right there is another hunter I didn't think I'd seen this oh yeah this is the white and blue I just saw blue I didn't see the white that's a nice colorway too but I, I don't know I just prefer that dapper gray and there's the uh, dapper ash it's these turquoise stripes in the, in the side and the turquoise uh, wheel stripe I don't know 
I think this might wear on me after a while. Red is a little bit better. And here's the the other one that I was interested in. But okay, anyway, I'm gonna shut this down for a second. I'm gonna do my. Oh yeah, we got stickers. Nice bikes and pizza. Uh, I'm gonna do the paperwork and uh, get going. I mean, these are lighter. So I was just talking with the uh, the sales guy Jeff. He's putting my uh, uh, temporary tag. That's him walking over there. He's putting the temporary tag on the bike. Uh, he said they'll get the tag in a few days and they'll mail it to me because I'm obviously not here in Austin. So here's the uh, classic. A little lighter. Mm-hmm. It's heavier than the uh, Hunter though by 30 pounds I think, 30 or 40 pounds, something like that. Looks, looks good. Black and red, even though I don't like black bikes. Yeah. Yeah, it does look good. The red is a little loud on the wheel stripe, I think. Yeah. On the tank and the side, okay. Given the, that it's a black bike, I would yeah. appreciate the red. Yeah. So that, I like. Color. I like the... Let's go with the bluish yeah. white. Yeah, I like this uh, sand tan color. I don't know what their proper name for it is. That looks pretty good. Okay. Come around the front. Man, this is a big dealership. Good Lord. I had no idea they were this big. I passed by them on the highway many times and never realized they were this big. Oh, then this whole area is accessories and yeah, clothing? Yeah, I mean, it's massive back here, everybody. This and is a helmets. huge place. TJ Cycle. And man, let me tell you, they have got an inventory of bikes here. A lot of off-road, a lot of gas gas, uh, off-road KTM, Husqvarna, you name it. They've got all kinds of stuff. Here's the Royal Enfield Himalayans. We'll look at those in a minute. But yeah, I don't know. That <laughs> That's army cool, man. That is cool. 6210 out the door. I could see, like, uh, just the dips guy. Uh huh. Doing, uh -huh. like, a, a scraped sand effect or something on yeah. top of that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, these things are a beast. Yeah, they're nice. Uh, I considered one, but they're, they're tall and they're somewhat heavy. And that's why I didn't want to get one of these uh, because I just couldn't see the ad or the upgrade from my XT250 because they're not that much more capable than the XT250 and they weigh a lot more. So. Scram 411. I sat on one of these there in uh, K. I like it. It fits me okay. Uh, but with the fact that they're going to be coming out with a uh, parallel twin water-cooled 450 very soon and dropping it in this chassis and the Himalayan chassis it made me hold off on wanting the Scram. So Scram might be something for next year or maybe a Himalayan uh, next year with that 450 and it might be interesting. So. Cool. Almost excellent. No, they got the same colorways they do for the Dapper Ash. Uh, well, that kind of looks interesting. Black and red and gold, that's different. That actually looks pretty good. And not much for black colored bikes if they're not all black, but Cool. All right. Well, and then over uh, here we got the K, uh, Kimco 300. Oh yeah. Which is the only place I know that you can get this. It's the one, the orange one, is the 300. S150 here. That's an interesting bike. I like the the large wheels on these. We had one of these in the Cannonball. The 300. 300s on the orange. Mm-hmm. Versus the 550, which... Oh, I think they're both 300s. Yeah. No 550s here yet. Yeah, this is a 300. Yep. I don't want to hit that bike, but I'm going to take yeah. this thing down off the stand. I think I am. There we go. Yeah, it's pretty heavy. Now, I'm short-legged, uh, and they've got a really wide leg bow, so I'm tippy-toe yeah. on both sides. I can almost flat foot one side when I lean it a bit. But it feels very much like the X-Max 300, I've noticed. Uh, obviously the Yamaha is going to be a little better fit and finish, a little more trusted name, but these Kimcos uh, have held up and they've been the cannibal and survived it. Hmm. <laughs> the floor is so slippery. The stand just flipped underneath the bike without even moving the bike. Cool. All right, I'm gonna go look at my new toy and find the sales guy. $29.99, S150 ABS. Hmm. I already have a 150. 
Yeah, but I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> that is not bad. Yeah. Oh man, like more cream pie. <laughs> it's like right here in your face, man. You, you don't. Bump in your you don't have to worry about you anything head hitting head. you. And it's got it. And look at this. It's got, it's a, got a lip. tapered yeah, it's got lip. A curve. Yeah, yeah. But it's so close, man. Why didn't they space it out a little bit? I mean, literally, with a full face yeah. helmet on, you hit one bump, whack, you're into the screen. It's only uh, four or five inches from your face. Cool. Interesting, huh? Squeeze out. All right, cool. Okay, so my uh, remaining balance is 44, what, 84? 44, 84 uh, after my uh, down payment that I put on it. So there's 2,000 bucks. There's another 2,000 bucks. And then uh, I'll let him count the 400 and change out of that stack. Change and I'll put those back. back exactly. Change because it was 44, 84, 14. So let me give this to Jess real quick. Perfect, no problem. And then I will circle back and come get you. Okay. All right, everybody, here it is. The 2023 Royal Enfield Hunter 350. Mine, mine, mine. <laughs> I just did the paperwork. Uh, they rolled it out of the showroom there, and uh, I just did a, a quick walk through a minute ago trying to figure out where everything is, uh, how to uh, operate basic controls on it uh, before I got on camera and made a silly fool of myself. And the first one was uh, how to get this uh, side panel open. Uh, the seat has a release latch, but the release cable goes over here and it's just behind this side panel so if you want to get the seat off of there for the very little tiny storage compartment that you've got what I was looking for was the toolkit make sure that that was included uh, we couldn't figure out how to get the seat off of the thing until uh, I went in there so I'm not gonna do a, a, a likes and gripes yet I haven't uh, lived with the bike long enough but this is an annoyance <laughs> and I'm probably gonna find a way around it right off the bat uh, I'll, I'll find a different place to put the little uh, cable uh, pole because this is a little bit of a kludge and that key is bent well that's not very nice now that key got sat on or something anyway so you have to remove uh, the side cover and there's a little pop clip here and a pop clip here so you just kind of pry outward on it and uh, it comes off so make sure you're hanging on to it when you pop it off of there because if it goes flying and then it lands on the cover you're going to scratch it all up and that's just not nice uh, so there's a little push clip here push clip here that go into these rubber recesses uh, and then getting that line back up on there is a little bit of a pain in the butt when you go to relock it but you know it's a very basic little lock you can see it's just a you know turn sideways and that catches in here in this metal plate so yeah you know built to a price point but it should work i'm just going to find a better way to do that without having to go for this little pull tab here and that is what releases the seat so gently put that down don't step on it uh pull the release seat comes off there is a little tab up here in the front that rides right under that uh, and here's your little pull cable that's just activating that very simple little latch there and uh, here's the uh, factory toolkit I haven't opened it up yet I don't want to do that right now I'll do that later with a full walk around video this is just uh, owners first raw impressions uh, haven't even ridden it around the parking lot yet so that's next but we're gonna put the seat back on there oh there's a little document strap there cool oh there's another one there cool and another one there cool hey that actually works you got three different ones so you can put your paperwork under there that's kind of smart better put it in the ziploc bag though i'll tell you that it's gonna get wet get the little tab lined up on there and give her a push and a click okay she's back on and i didn't step on my side panel good boy all right so finding these little push tabs is kind of funky okay that one went in this one kind of went in there we go and then rotate this lock that no 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 oh there it is and get it pushed in you got to kind of hunt for it get it to push all the way in and then pull it back out okay she's good to go she's back on so 
my straightened out key. Glad I saw that. The kind of the, the the key is a little on the soft side. This is not going to be a gripes video. I'm just curious why my key was bent to start out with. Okay. Let's start it up, shall we? Oh, and I did put a uh, ram ball on here off camera. Uh, pulled one of my uh, handlebar bridge bolts right here. Put a ram ball so I can mount my phone up here for the ride home. I was going to put a 360 camera on the front of it. Uh, there's not an easy way to mount that, so that'll have to be for the second ride video. So here we go. Key on. Get the sweep. Goes back. It's uh, running economically right now, and it's in gear one, so it doesn't roll off of the side stand. Uh, that's one thing I will point out before we go anywhere with it. I had read uh, some questions or concerns uh, from some of the other uh, owners in the UK, and they had mentioned that that side stand uh, sits pretty proud, so the bike is not leaned over very far. And I'm going to have to agree with that. Uh, if you're on any kind of a sloped angle, this bike doesn't lean into that side stand very much. So it's almost upright, and it doesn't take much force at all to uh, kind of lean that thing up off the stand, good and bad. You know, you park in a weird area, and that thing is very likely going to tip itself over or roll off of the center stand if you don't leave it in gear. So watch out for that. And of course, you can put it on the center stand, which I haven't done yet. Let's do that. Why not? Let's go to neutral. Clicky. Stand it up, and well, it's a little heavy. Heaving it up, not too bad, though. Uh, the lever could be a little longer or give a, a different compound, uh, you know, curve to it to give you more leverage, but that's not bad. Not too bad. Pull it down. It's easier coming down than it is up, but just step your full weight straight down on these. It's still like any other scooter, I understand. Uh, stand on it real hard. The weight going down is more important than the lifting up. Lifting up is just to stabilize. So it's your weight that lifts it, not your hand back here. So, yeah, that's not bad. Okay. While it is on the uh, center stand and in neutral, let's give it a start, shall we? So, start, run, switch, off, run, and then start is pushing it this way, so there's no button. <laughs> thump, 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 thump. I went through it and checked, uh, did my own PDI before uh, I got to this point. I uh, made sure that the oil is sitting in the crankcase where it should be, uh, up to the proper level. <laughs> Look at the... Da -da 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 -da. There's that thumper for you. Shaking the whole bike. Gotta love it. Uh, yeah, not a lot to uh, go through other than uh, the exhaust note here. I'll try to put my head over here and reach the grip. Where's the grip? There's the grip. It's got a pretty pleasing exhaust note. Uh, it's a little poppy, huffy, but uh, it's deep. You know, it's got a pretty good sound to it for a factory exhaust. Uh, I'll probably be working with a couple of uh, local companies, or at least U.S.-based companies, to see if we can make a uh, slip-on or maybe a whole uh, exhaust replacement for this. But that doesn't look bad. I'm not, I'm not displeased with that at all. It's, uh, it's tucked in nicely. Follow the lines of the bike okay. It does stick out a bit from this angle. A little bit more than I would like, but I think that's mostly for uh, passenger foot peg placement and everything else. Uh, if it were too far in, it might get too close to the swing arm, and if it were any shorter, I think uh, there could be problems with, uh, you know, passenger getting their feet baked off. So if I put a shorty on here, or something a little bit shorter, I'll make sure that it's got just enough of a downward angle to it, not quite as upswept as that, so it wouldn't get in the way of the passenger peg. But again, I, I rarely ever ride with a pillion, so I'm not too concerned about it. Pretty cool. I haven't sat on the back of it yet. I'll do that in a little bit. It's uh, blazing hot out here. It's over 100 degrees already, so I can't do uh, too much walk around unless I want to dehydrate out here. So let's... Uh, climb aboard shall we pop it down off the stand uh, it's gonna be a five-speed transmission one down four up neutral right in the middle between first and second just like anything else uh, a few people have said that these are a little tricky to get into neutral let's see if it causes no nope, I didn't have any problem No, it's going right into neutral for me so those other people might just have different transmissions or not as deaf to foot as I have so let's roll it around, just in the parking lot here, because I don't have the rest of my gear on, and I'm not going anywhere. My son is still inside uh, soaking up the air conditioning, and uh, I'm uh, needing to garb up and figure out where I'm going before uh, we go anywhere. 
Yeah. Transmission shifts nice and smooth, snickety snick, no problem, up, down. Of course, I'm not really getting into the higher revs or speeds here, but yeah. It's got a very heavy flywheel, I'll tell you that. Uh, I can feel it in the uh, the shifting or the shift timing and don't run over any nails back here. That would be a bad day. Uh, the shift timing on this, I can already tell you to go smoothly with it. You basically uh, don't even roll the throttle back up after your shift. You just release the clutch and the uh, inertia of that heavy flywheel is going to rev match right in for you without even changing your throttle position after the drop. But I'll uh, learn it a little bit more as I go along. So yeah, snickety snick. It sounds really good. I'm going to have to get used to the low idle on this thing because I swear it sounds and feels like it's about to die. But that's normal for these big Royal Enfield twins. They just barely take over. <laughs> and on my Japanese bikes or anything like that, I would think, oh, yeah, I've got to bump the idle. Of course, this is fuel injected, so you're not really doing that. The computer's taking care of it. Clutch is engaging right off of the grip, so that might need a bit of adjustment. Feels good though. It's very lightweight and nimble. Uh, I I like it. She's flickable. Let's not do a header down the ramp, shall we? Okay. Well, it's hot, so I'm going to uh, finish getting my riding gear and the rest of my paperwork in order. Uh, I'm all signed up in there. Everything's been done. Oh wait. Let's do the uh, side stand kill. Yeah, it's got a side stand kill. Good safety feature. Um, I'm going to get the ride ready. We're going to figure out where we're going to eat. Kevin uh, has got to go back to work eventually today. And uh, we were talking about getting burgers or maybe some Mexican food or something like that before we head out of town. Uh, but I'm going to uh, put on my jacket and uh, get ready for the ride. Uh, I'm going to mount my phone up here. Oh, excellent. Thanks. Everybody wants to see what a fat guy looks like. Okay, go ahead. So Kevin is six foot, right? Six foot, 270. Six foot, 270. So he's not a circus bear, but... It, lo it looks a little small-ish for him. Now, the one thing that we noticed when we sat down on it inside is the bars are very f much forward. And I mentioned that when I sat on it uh, in uh, Katie. Yeah. Uh, so it, you're leaning forward to reach this. I've already ordered a set of bar risers that are about an inch and a half, two inches. So it's going to bring them up a bit and back a bit. And I think that'll be perfect, but we'll see when those arrive. The pegs, I can actually ride this. Yeah. Peg placement is great. Uh, they're not forward. They're not mid controls. They're standard bike, not quite sport bike position. Sport bike would be tucked more behind your hips, but these are pretty much straight down. It's great. Uh, and then uh, overall ergonomics on it are great. Uh, that seat feels very comfortable right now. I do have a custom seat coming in for it, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, I'm just going to ride it as is for the next couple of weeks and uh, get to know it and let you know what my thoughts are as we go along. But I will catch up with you on the ride home. All right, everybody, welcome back. Uh, it's been about, uh, oh, I don't know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes or something. We just sat inside and uh, I did my insurance stuff with Geico. That took a little bit because Geico didn't have this listed as an available model uh, in their system and they had to create it. So Am I the first one in Texas to register and insure one of these uh, hunters? That's kind of odd. I know there are more of them on the road. I'm not the first owner. Um, I haven't put my phone mount up here yet, but I'll do that after we eat. Uh, Kevin is taking us over to a uh, burger place a couple, three miles away. So we're going to sit and uh, eat because my stomach is totally empty and trying to turn inside out. And that's my maiden voyage on the uh, Royal Enfield Hunter 350. Let's get some food, dude neutral thumpy 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 I'm gonna cover this up that bothers me I'm not gonna start the gripes I'm not gonna start the gripes I love this thing already man nothing negative just little things that are gonna change for my tastes the transmission shifts really nice snickety snick I like it That low idle is so weird, man. That's going to take some adjusting for my brain. Ooh, it's hot. I didn't check the temperature. I'm going to have to look at it. I think it's about 100 and change.
rear suspension is pretty stiff. Oh, it shifts so easy. This is great. I love it. Oh, and the air feels so good, man. Let me tell you. Woo, it's hot. Mirrors are very buzzy. That's the one complaint that everybody uh, all has in common, it seems like. Everybody that's reviewed it or ridden it, they all say the same thing. The mirrors buzz too much. So. I'll put some bar end mirrors on here. I'll probably get the Royal Enfield ones uh, just so it's uh, all Royal Enfield, Royal Enfield as much as possible. But I might end up doing something like the uh, CRG bar ends out here. We'll find out. Not going that way? Okay. I'm following you, man. Oh, yeah, this thing's going to be great. It's a nice, uh... <laughs> in the shade. Yeah, that's right, stopping in the shade. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be a great little back road and commuter bike, it's gonna be fantastic. The bar risers are gonna help me because I'm short-armed. I'm 5'6", 5'7", uh, with my boots on, but that doesn't change my arm reach. Um, and it's sitting forward. It's not a sporty seating position, but it's decidedly lean forward to get to these bars. So I think about two inch risers on here will be perfect. Just bump them up a bit. But it's not uncomfortable at all in this, you know, this layout. I hope we didn't lose my son. Oh man, that rig has plenty of room to turn narrow but he took two lanes and then some that's ridiculous dude the truck's not that big it's very torquey fourth gear just roll right up downshift optional <laughs> nimble feels good I will be replacing the tires very soon just because I am kind of a diehard when it comes to uh, there's a good bump when it comes to uh, Michelin's I, I just I really like the Michelin road series they used to be the pilot road now they just call them road so road 5 road 6 very very good tires good all season performance wet dry doesn't matter very predictable cornering uh good wear characteristics are just absolutely fantastic tires so i've already got a set of these on order for this bike 110 front 140 rear i think yeah 140 switch gear is pretty good uh it takes a little getting used to it's not the standard uh, Japanese fare you know uh, normal uh, metric bike kind of stuff but uh, it feels good enough the reach seems a little bit longer uh, to get to it but it's positive engagement you know it's tactile one thing I am noticing it looks like the bars are rolled a little bit too far back toward me so I'm gonna have to tip them forward a little bit because even the controls are tilted back so I'll sort that out I think we lost my son already because of that truck that was taking up all the all the road back there. Buddy's Burger, it's cool. Never been here. Low idle just barely ticking over, man. That's so different. It's gonna take my brain a while to get used to that. It feels like it's almost gonna die. I'd love a, to see a tachometer on here to know what the revs are right now because it just it feels so slow, like eight or nine hundred RPM barely. Smells like laundry over here. <laughs> mm. 
no shade to be found. It's just hot. That's what Kevin is looking for too, is some shade, but I don't think we've got any shade. Well, there's a spot. I'll just pull in there next to him. So my ride home today, I'm going to be focusing on back roads uh, and, you know, slower pace because this is a, a brand new air-cooled motor, so I don't want to stress it out. And this thing has a 350-mile uh, first oil change or 300 miles, something like that. Uh, so don't want to... Yeah, I think that semi that was blocking the road back there squashed him out, so uh, I'm going to send him the address. Anyway, we're going to go eat. I'll uh, continue talking inside. Might even do a little quick live. <sighs> okay. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. All right, everybody. We finished uh, eating fraternizing, talking, chatting with a lot of people here. Uh, there have been several people that have stopped by already to look at the uh, hunter. They're all like, oh wow, that's so cool, what is that? Uh, <laughs> the couple of uh, bike guys came by and they were looking at it and uh, just really, really impressed with it. And pardon me while I'm trying to unthread the, uh, the mess here. I don't know what's going on. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, they were slobbering over. They've got big bikes, and uh, one guy's got a Triumph, the other guy had a Bonneville, and they were talking about it. And I said, yeah, this is basically Bonneville with less weight, less power, less cost. Very slick. Anyway, so uh, I'm all set up here. My son is waiting for me over there. He's getting gas, I guess. They're just waiting in the shade. Uh, I am going to get uh, cabled up here, plugged in, and rolling. It's going to be a two-and-a-half-hour hot ride on the back roads down to Houston oh yeah yeah and uh, the USB on the handlebars Kevin is pointing out uh, I saw that I wouldn't have even known that's there uh, because I have not even read the instruction manual on the bike yet uh, but I saw this in other reviews uh, online they were saying this thing even comes with a USB and sure enough so I plugged that in uh, it's tied in over here to my uh, quad lock mount uh, put the ram ball on there to replace one of the bridge bolts and yeah done game and it's so hot out here 104 104 106 oh man i didn't take my my weather photo i should do that shouldn't i 101 is the official right here i'm sure it's hot huh 103 yeah it might say i'm 101 austin but yeah doink Anywho. It's one, it sure is hot. And it's uh, headed up for 105. It's supposed to be the, the temperature here. It's 102-ish in Houston, so it's not getting any cooler. No matter what I do, it's not getting cooler. So check my uh, anti-sun fade there. Oh, yeah, I like that. That's the, uh, the speckle finish stuff, yeah. So Kevin's trying to sell his Riker if anybody's interested. It's got the uh, Elka suspension on there, a custom paint job, and all the goodies. So hit him up. I don't need it. No, I don't need it. Yeah. You got a lot shorter ride home than I do. Whew. Yes, I do. Man, 150 miles or something home for me. So, anyway, I'm off. Thanks for coming out, sir. I will catch up with you in the next couple days and uh, we'll figure out what's what. I'll wait until you leave. Okay. All right, back it up. And I think I'm going out that way. I'll get over to that light. Yeah, he sees me. Left on Ferguson Lane. Okay, so we'll go this way. Oh, I guess we won't go yet. Man, this low tick over idle is just tripping my brain. Uh, am I ever going to get out of here? Wow, it's quite the traffic all of a sudden. I think he's telling me to go the other way, but uh, I'm doing back roads. So I could vary the engine speed up and down on this thing. Oh, it feels good to get moving. Good Lord, it's hot. Woo, buddy. 
Take me home, little hunter. So, I'll have a lot more opinions as the uh, ride progresses here over the next few hours. But what uh, what I'm thinking about this uh, hunter and my intended riding chores and you know where it kind of fits into my uh, riding style is as a commuter and a back road uh, tourer so kind of the role that my little super cub 125 has been in for the last few years but obviously this has got a little bit more potent motor on it roughly double the horsepower and uh three and a half times the fuel capacity so this is a 3.4 or 3.5 gallon fuel tank and uh, the little Super Cub only holds one gallon exactly. So the big difference here is just going to be range because they get roughly the same fuel economy, at least the advertised fuel economy, uh, in real world use. People are saying anywhere from 85 to 100 miles to the gallon. Well, I mean, my Cub gets 100 and 10 at wide open on the highway so roughly similar speeds this one should be getting close to that 100 miles to the gallon that'd be great tuscany way you can cut the weeds out here With my earplugs in, I can barely hear the engine. Uh, of course, I'm not really wrapping it out, but uh, I can barely hear this engine. I can hear the thump thump of the exhaust, but there's really no other mechanical noise. It's, uh, it's a very quiet, pleasant little bike. Whee! The rear suspension's pretty stiff. I will have to concur with uh, the other reviewer owners. Uh, rear suspension is a bit tight. I need to look at the uh, preload on it. I didn't even pay attention. I th it's whatever the factory setting is. So it, uh, if it's on the lowest setting, then these shocks are pretty stiff. Of course, everything is fresh on the bike. It hasn't broken in at all. It's got you know a whopping 11 miles on it right now. So uh, usually suspension components and other stuff like that kind of breaks in and softens up a little bit. The bike, you know, engine, transmission, everything loosens up over uh, the first thousand miles or so. But if the rear shocks are sprung too high, then uh, obviously aftermarket. We'll come to the rescue for that. Should be reasonably cheap. It'd be nice to get some relatively inexpensive shocks for it that are uh, compression and rebound adjustable but you know then the front end is not adjustable either so it's kind of the beauty of bikes like this is they're so simple there's no adjustments there's nothing to do to them you get on and you ride and that's really the reason that I want this bike this style of bike particularly is it's back to basics riding there's nothing fancy going on here there's no uh, there's no uh, extra electronics, ride modes, none of that. You've got uh, anti-lock brakes and uh, fuel injection, and that's it. That's all you need. Cornering is just very easy and neutral. The bike follows a line just fine. I'm not having to push or you know adjust in line. Of course, I'm not going fast yet. It's just a very light, simple, easy to ride bike. Very nimble. It's got a pretty short wheelbase. Uh, I'll throw the specs up here. I don't remember the wheelbase. Uh, 
and uh, the suspension stats off the top of my head. Uh, I'm still too new to the bike. Oops, I'm grabbing all my cables here. Uh, it's got a pretty steep steering rake, short wheelbase, so it's quite nimble in town. Uh, I'll find out how it feels out on the highway at 55, 60 miles an hour, and I'm sure it's going to be just fine. You know, large 17 inch wheels on it, uh, it should track effortlessly. And I'm going to try to take it easy on the motor. Uh, you never know what the uh, rev is on this because there's no tack. So you're not really sure where you are in the rev range until you hit a rev limiter. And I don't want to do that. So I'm trying to keep it calm and not really uh, spinning the motor up much until I get used to the bike. Obviously get it past its break-in period. So I'm short shifting it and just being nice. Several of the owner reviews that I've watched online, uh, they said that when they got in at the 300 mile service, that the valves were tight already. Uh, and a few owners said, you should just go ahead and open it up early. You know, it, do your valve check early, like when you get it home. So I might do that, but I'll probably just ride it for a while. Uh, I think 300 miles is fine, not, you know, to concerned about the valves being over tight but I'll definitely pull it apart at or just before that 300 mile service mark set the valve clearances do the early oil change put a magnetic uh, sump plug in it might even put a magnetic uh, donut ring on the oil filter give it the best uh, fighting chance for longevity and here I am just purring along at 55. I thought I was going about 45, so yeah. I mean, it's just doing fine. <laughs> of course, this is Austin, so you know, 55 mile an hour feet of road, that means traffic's gonna be doing 75 plus. Uh, yep. So it'll be interesting to see, uh, well, I've got GPS right there. I was gonna say, it'll be interesting to see later when I pull up my GPS stats to know what speedometer deviation is, but I've got it right here. So uh, I'm reading 51.52 on GPS and I'm reading 55.56 here. So the uh, speedo on this is optimistic quite a bit. It looks like about three or four miles per hour optimistic at 55. We get it up to 60 indicated. A little bit more there's 60 indicated right there 57 so it's about three miles per hour fast so i'm not sure if the speed sensor is on the front wheel rear wheel counter shaft sprocket where it is but uh, tire size differences might uh, alter that figure a little bit doing good on the green lights so far Plenty torquey. Feels good. Another thing that I've read on these is that the uh, the motors really loosen up after about a thousand miles. So people are seeing better fuel economy and uh, higher top speeds after the motor is well bedded in, you know, anywhere from 600 to a thousand miles in. That's pretty typical. For most bikes anyway. I've never owned a a Royal Enfield or a British bike, so I don't really know what their uh, break-in procedures and mechanical eccentricities are. So Iker 
Motors uh, bought the majority stake in Royal Enfield back in 2013, 2014, and then I think they took over almost all the production, or all of the production, in 2015, so... Uh, RE's uh, uh, product offerings and their uh, quality control has gone through the roof, you know, gone very good since uh, Iker has taken over, so I don't think being a uh, Indian manufacturing company uh, detracts from this at all. If anything, I think it might have uh, improved things for them. Much larger company, a lot more uh, R&D behind them, so they've just got the expertise and engineering at their disposal to build a better mousetrap. But again, I don't know much about RE's history at all. I do know that I like these bikes, especially at the price point. If they're uh, reliable and robust for this kind of price, then, man, Japanese manufacturers better look out. It's a shot across the bow. Palmer Lane. I used to live out here, but way up north. Off of Palmer and Mopac. Well, between Mopac and I-35. Almost dead center. First gear in this thing is pretty long. Man, that low idle is freaking me out. Low idle is tripping my brain. It's so low. Ah, the smell of new bike. Actually, what I smell now is clutch or brakes. Brakes feel good on it so far, but I haven't really gotten in them yet. A lot of uh, reviewers have mentioned that the brakes are pretty wooden. They're not very progressive. Uh, I don't have an opinion yet. Lever feel is pretty good on it. Uh, it's a very broad, long lever. Uh, I might put shorter levers on it, just that don't stick out so far. Uh, these are really long. I mean, that's, that's over six inch long lever there. Um, they do have a, uh, a little uh, score mark there to snap off instead of tearing up your perch or your master cylinder, so that's a good idea. I'll probably put some shorter adjustable levers on there, but uh, as far as caliper feel, you know, and uh, lever pull, they're fairly tactile. I don't, they don't feel spongy, so that's good. These do have uh, stainless braided brake lines, front and rear. I thought that was a nice touch when I looked at them, I don't know, a few weeks ago over at the dealer in Katy. It's pretty impressive for a entry level motorcycle. And I'm gonna harp on that throughout this ride and the reviews that I do on this bike. The whole moniker of uh, a beginner bike or entry level bike, it really annoys me because it's, it does the bike a disservice, and it's really the uh, the reviewers that are coming up with that name, and it's demeaning and inaccurate. This is a small bore bike. Let's call it what it is. It's a small bore bike. It's not for beginners necessarily. It is beginner friendly, but it's not a beginner bike. Uh, entry level, entry level uh, kind of you know that could either mean money or expertise, but uh, in either case that could apply to this but that doesn't mean that it's stuck at uh, an entry level or beginner level type of uh, riding i'm a lifelong motorcyclist i've been riding for you know oh, 38 plus years on the streets i've got well over two million miles under my belt on all flavors of bikes big small you know touring whatever uh and I'm buying this because this is what I want. I want a smaller, more nimble bike, something that's just basic. I like the fact that it's basic. Uh, and 
I'm far from a beginner. So <laughs> calling it a beginner bike is just, I don't know, I got a problem with that whole classification you know it just uh, it's short-sighted in my opinion uh, it's too limiting in the definition and uh, it carries a negative connotation with it that doesn't need to be there it's a small bore bike call it what it is and it could be for riders of all skill levels and backgrounds it's it's a it's a motorcycle it's a basic machine with wheels and no frills and if that is reliable then it's a winning combination in my book Oop. yeah I think if the bars were up about an inch and a half two inches to where I'm sitting a little bit more upright it would be 100% perfect so those bar risers are on their way in should have those very soon. Where are you going? Hurry up and wait. I keep looking for a, a linear fuel gauge on there, but it's this inner ring beneath the speedo i don't like being next to you fat boy uh oh but that was a bump uh yeah so i keep looking at it and, uh, oh yeah there it is <laughs> now with the advertised fuel economy that this is supposed to get which is north of 85 miles to the gallon I should, i'll be easily able to make it home on a single tank of fuel maybe you know half a tank of fuel we're gonna find out 145 150 miles something like that Oh, right lane ends. Crap. Oh, it ends after the intersection. Okay. Oh, I mean, it's so slow. That low idle is just going to take a while to get used to. Nineteen miles on the clock. Well, twelve of those are mine. What did I have? Seven point one, seven point six. I don't remember what it said on the showroom floor. They drove it around a little bit. That's more than just a PDI test. <laughs> Somebody else was enjoying it, going, "Oh man, I like this." What I smelled a minute ago, uh, I was thinking was uh, brakes from somebody else. No, it's actually this bike. It must be uh, paint on the cylinder or on the exhaust that I'm smelling. It's uh, it's kind of a hot paint, hot plasticky smell. It's not bad, but it's not the typical smell that I'm used to with uh, Japanese bikes. You know that the hot. Uh, hot electronic smell. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. You know, everybody that's gotten a new bike, uh, any of the Japanese bikes, they've all got almost a characteristic uh, hot phenolic kind of smell to it for the first few hundred miles. This is a little bit more plasticky smell, so we'll find out. It should dissipate after the engine really uh, bakes and cures everything in. We'll find out. Hurry up and stop. We're not even near rush hour yet. This is only, what, uh, 1.30 in the afternoon, something like that. Yeah, 2.20.
told it to avoid uh, freeways and all that. I was hoping to get me a little bit more back road action, but it looks like it's got me on uh, the highway here for quite a while. Seat is comfy. I like it. Good seating position. Very comfortable seat, in fact. The uh, accessory seat that I have coming is a Royal Enfield, uh, you know, add-on or accessory. Uh, and it's a little bit more sculpted than this one, but the thing that I liked about it was the, uh, the material texture and also it has red stitching, red piping on it. Not really piping as much as stitching, uh, but I think that'll blend with the red accents on here quite nicely. Now, whether it's going to be more comfortable or less comfortable, I don't know. We'll find out. I've ordered pretty much every factory accessory for this thing from Royal Enfield, a couple of aftermarket ones, and uh, the only exception to that is the uh, engine guards. I have not gotten the uh, Royal Enfield engine guard, uh, either the small one or the large one, because there's an aftermarket one that I really like. It's a little bit larger in its hoop circumference, but it doesn't stick out as far on the sides like diagonally as the Royal Enfield large engine guard uh, but it, it goes down in more of a, a delta shape and the reason I like that one is because uh, I could put uh, highway pegs on it so the Royal Enfield screen I don't think I could get highway pegs on there it's too high up and the small one is too close in I don't think it would give any place to stick it out you know your feet would be sitting right on top of the, uh, the transmission housing there I got the passenger backrest and grab rails. Probably won't use it, but it was cheap, so I ordered it to uh, put on there just to see what it looks like, get a review on it, and potentially use it as a backstop for my uh, roll bag that I'll put on the back seat. It might work nicely for that. Uh, the passenger pegs on this bike are not removable. They're welded, or at least the, uh, the brackets are welded. You could pull the pegs themselves off, but you'd still have the, the bracket that's welded to the frame. I guess if someone were definitely uh, determined to not have the uh, passenger pegs on this, they could cut those off of the rear subframe, maybe even uh, slot them with male-female uh, inset tubes or something to where they could be removed from the frame and then put back on with some bolts or something like that, but I don't see any reason to take them off personally. They'll be a nice point to tie down luggage to, in my case. Oh, thank you, Cloud. Shade. Okay, so I've been trying to watch in the background here. The Eco on the dash is at a certain throttle position. If I go above that, it goes away. I haven't really been able to feel if it's RPM dependent or anything, but I'm cruising along at 55 actual. 58, almost 60 indicated. And when I stay out of the throttle, just kind of at a maintenance load, that eco light comes on. So I guess that's the uh, most efficient running envelope. I was hoping for a little bit more back road so I could vary my engine speed up and down instead of just sitting here at a fixed RPM too long. Guess I can just drop a gear and run at a higher RPM for a minute. Drop to fourth and spin the motor up a bit. Yep, 
Yeah, able to gain speed uphill easily, fourth gear, no problem. I'm able to gain up hill in fifth gear, no problem. It feels, uh, power-wise, it feels a lot like my XT250 with a little bit more torque. I want to say the XT250 is an uh, 18 horsepower bike, but it's only got about 12 pound-feet of torque, if I remember right. This thing is basically 20 and 20. So it's got a very flat torque curve across almost the entire rev range above, like, 3,500 RPM, it's just flat all the way across the chart, right up to red line. The feel of this reminds me of the old uh, BMW Airheads, like the R65 and stuff like that. Feels very much like that. A little bit less power and torque, obviously, but uh, the the ergonomics, kind of the thrum of the motor, really uh, is what it's evoking in my memory. Man, that lumbering tick over. It almost feels like it's laboring going that slow, like cuck, 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 cuck. <laughs> Clutch actuation on it is very easy. Uh, I've read some reviews and watched some reviews on uh, YouTube where people were saying that the clutch was very stiff or stiffer than it should be. Uh, not in my book. That's one of the easiest clutches I've ever used. Not the lightest, but definitely the easiest as far as engagement uh, and ease of use. No problem at all. It's not stiff, not, not even close, but some of the, uh, the newer slipper, cl uh, slipper clutches and, you know, uh, slipper assists and I forget what Kawasaki calls theirs, but the ones on like the uh, Z400 and the Ninja 400, those things are feather light, almost annoyingly so. I don't like them, actually. They're a little bit too light. They're not tactile. You don't know when you're squeezing it. It's just like, is there anything there on the other end of that lever, or am I just swinging a lever with my fingers? Oh, good God, it's hot. This thing, you know you're pulling it in, but it's not, you know, it's not stiff or difficult. The very broad levers are uh, interesting to me. They're very flat. They're not rounded like uh, most Japanese bikes. They're they're very wide, thin, and flat. So they give you a good uh, good surface to pull on. It just feels weird under the fingers, to me anyway. it's hot. Have I mentioned that it's hot yet?
guess I should turn my high beams on. A lot of people uh, ask questions about that. Sometimes they're not nice questions. They're more assumptions and uh, insults about why do I ride with my high beams on? Well, for those of you that have asked nicely, here's the, here's the response. In Texas and in most places in the United States, it is an accepted and actually taught safety procedure uh, to ride with uh, high beams on on motorcycles during the daytime hours. Obviously at nighttime and dusk we dip to low beams, but uh, cagers here, automotive drivers, cars, trucks, etc. Anything that's not a two-wheeler, we call cagers. <laughs> I call cagers. Uh, they're not very attentive uh, here. They're not really looking for motorcyclists because in the United States, Motorcycles are not a primary mode of transportation like they are in a lot of the other countries around the world, especially uh, Asian and Latin countries. So motorcycles here are more of a pastime or a, uh, an enthusiast's uh, mode of transportation like myself. And it poses a lot of safety challenges on the road when nobody's looking for you. Uh, and in some cases, they just don't care. You know, they, they, just, they see you and they don't care. They just move over because they're in a cage and their whole attitude is, yeah, go ahead and hit me. I'm not going to get hurt. You'll have to pay for my paint job. Well, yeah, for somebody else in a cage, that's true. But motorcyclists don't have cages or airbags or any of that. So we try to play this as a no contact sport. So back to the point, uh, high beams make us much more visible in daylight traffic because we've got a much smaller front profile, uh, only one headlight. Uh, it's a smaller physical footprint on the road. So it helps motorists identify us at a glance in traffic. And I can't count the number of times or situations where riding with my low beam on, I've had cars pull right out in front of me, uh, do dumb stuff, you know, cut across me, whatever, and just not see me, you know, it's attentional blindness. And with the high beam on, there's a much lower percentage of those uh, cases, much, much lower. So they see you coming. Uh, and some of them, occasionally, they'll flash their brights at you. Yeah, whatever, man. If my little dinky headlight bothers your eyes in bright daylight, why don't you try looking at that ball of fire in the sun? See what you think about that. So the, <laughs> the difference in brightness levels between my bright beam and ambient daylight, it's not that much. But it's enough to make me visible. And if I got your attention and you noticed me and it annoyed you enough to flash your high beams at me, then guess what? I win the game because I got you to notice me and that's what matters. So that's why motorcyclists here in the States will ride with their high beams on during daylight hours. It's an accepted safety practice. It is recommended and actually taught in the Motorcycle Safety Foundation courses. Uh, it's in the Texas uh, Riders Handbook, you name it. So there's the answer.
man, this thing is a hoot. This seating position, even without a windscreen on it, this is just so easy and so pleasant to ride. I'm sitting here with an ear-to-ear -ear grin in my helmet. My cheeks are starting to hurt. I wondered why. <laughs> this is so effortless. It's so comfortable. It's just, it feels natural. I would like the bars to be up a tiny bit higher. Uh, taller riders might find the rider triangle a little bit cramped. I noticed that the, the foot pegs are fairly high on it, but I'm short-legged and it feels good to me. I've got you know, about a 90 degree bend in my knees. I've got a 30 inch inseam, five foot six tall. This thing is so effortless. I love it. I am going to put down a ton of touring miles on this. And yes, before anybody mentions it in the comments, I'm not breaking this in 100% according to the manual. It says you're not supposed to exceed like 46 miles an hour or something like that for the first few hundred miles. Yeah, sorry. That's not gonna work anywhere in the United States unless you're just rolling around your neighborhood. You're gonna have to stay up with road speeds, which is, you know, 50 to 55 miles an hour, you know, that's fairly safe, even if the, the highway speed limits are 65, 70, something like that. If you're doing 55, then you're getting along without being uh, too much of an inconvenience for everybody else and uh, definitely not a danger to yourself, hopefully. I'm just going to spin the engine up and down a little bit alternate between fourth and fifth and try to maintain 60 indicated which is about 57 actual The suspension is firm, but it's pretty composed. I don't really notice any wallowing or uh, hobby horsing at all. It's uh, it's pretty even as far as the uh, the fork compliance versus the rear shock compliance. There have only been a few bumps where I've kind of felt the front end floating independently of the rear. Shift again, run the engine up a bit. I don't need to downshift to climb this hill, but trying to vary the engine RPM a bit up and down, not get stuck in the same rev range too long. Kind of hard to do on the highway when you got cues of traffic behind you. not to go more than about 50% throttle at any given point. Yeah, I'm only at about 30% throttle to maintain, you know, 60 indicated here. Now, the one thing about these Royal Enfields uh, that is of note is the three-year unlimited mile warranty on these things. So they've got a 36-month unlimited warranty. 
So if you bought one of these and used it as your primary commuter and tour and everything else, put 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 miles on it. Rack up those miles, see what you can do. And as long as you've maintained the uh, maintenance, you know, per the schedule and there's no real obvious reason why uh, something would have failed, then uh, hopefully their warranty covers it. I haven't tried the emergency flashers yet. I'll do that later. I keep looking down there at that switch going, oh yeah. This is perfect timing to get this bike too, for me anyway. Just ahead of the fall riding season, I'll have my accessories lined out here pretty quickly. I'll get this, uh, you know, the minor user tweaks and preferences upgraded on it, you know, bar and mirrors, that sort of thing. A little windscreen of some kind. And uh, be just in time for fall touring and Camping, motor camping, hammock camping, weekend day tripping, you name it. It's going to be great. I hope it doesn't totally replace the Super Cub in my, uh, my memory bank. Well, I can't replace it in my memory banks, but not in my riding chores, let's say. They're very similar in their utilitarian aspect in my mind, but... Uh, different in their execution. Oh wow, old cop car. Do some deceleration runs here. That's something else I've been wanting to do. Rising Sun Vineyard. I just saw that sign back there. Ah, uh, oh, I'm gonna stop. Uh, I want to check out some of these uh, Austin area wineries. That'd be great. Last time I was up this way, uh, riding with Kevin on the scooters, we passed by a couple. And I thought, oh man, we need to do a winery tour out here. That'd be fun. Some of them have their little uh, bistro uh, kind of restaurant in there, and they serve. You know, little samples of this and that, and sandwiches and stuff. So, neat little uh, restaurant, do a, a vineyard tour, taste a few wines, and definitely worse ways to spend a weekend. I know what this reminds me of. The Honda CB200 Twin Star. That's what it reminds me of. It's just got a lot more torque, and the engine doesn't rev to the moon, you know, not 12 or 14,000 RPM redline. The little Twin Star, the feel of the bike feels almost identical to the little uh, Honda CB200. I don't really want to pass this guy, and then he just has to pass me in a minute. Yeah, it feels like a Honda Twin Star with a torqueier engine. I still think it feels like one of the older BMW Airheads, but yeah, still. That's another bike that I've been wanting to find is a, uh, a decent little CB200 twin to restore and play with. I really like those bikes. They're, they're lightweight, they're small, really efficient, and that little... Uh, parallel twin just revs to the moon man you gotta wring its neck to get anywhere sometimes but they just sound so good
but of course with those classic bikes you've got all the downsides of you know the old metallurgy uh they're very rust prone everywhere tanks and you know frame and everything they just they tend to rust uh they're carbureted the electrical systems on them are finicky they're always replacing stuff they got bad brakes bad suspension so it's always uh, a project or a challenge to uh, own and operate those things unless you totally go through it and rebuild it from the ground up with new stuff uh, you're always tinkering and fixing something and i don't like to wrench on my bikes more than ride them so going with a, a modern retro classic like this is the way to go and the price would probably be the same or cheaper for something like this versus a, a classic Honda because you're going to put you're going to spend three or four thousand dollars for a decent condition bike and then you're still going to have a bunch of stuff that you have to do to it I and mean, if you bought a basket case for a thousand bucks you're going to have to put three or four thousand bucks in it if you want it to be reliable and you know not end up on the side of the road every other day and they require a lot of maintenance this $39.99 I paid $4,900 right out and that's with all the state taxes and you know the dealer fees and everything else but it's got a warranty and it's new it's brand new it's fuel injected it's modern it's got modern paint and modern metallurgy so the frame is going to be stronger less flex better suspension even if it's budget suspension it's better than that old stuff <laughs> Classic bikes are, uh, they're fun, but they can be a handful. transitional response on it super easy just a little bit of counter pressure on the bars So I'm going through all the reviews in my head of things that I've heard about this uh, new J-Series 349cc engine. Everyone's saying that it's just absolutely silky smooth. I wouldn't agree with that. It has just enough vibration and character to it that you know it's there. Uh, I don't really feel too much uh, vibration through the pegs. There is some, just enough to know it's there. It's not buzzy, tingly, annoying at you know 60 miles an hour. I'm not running it anywhere near red line, so I don't know if that changes as the revs go higher, but uh, for now, running along at these speeds, there's a pleasant, mild vibration through the bars and the pegs. You know it's there, it's doing something, but it's not obtrusive, it's not annoying at all. Not unpleasant. And of course, these are rubber damp foot pegs, so they're gonna offer some isolation.
full throttle. Yeah, able to climb up a hill, no problem. Torquey little motor. Yeah, I could do a cross-country trip on this thing easy. No problem.
in such a hurry to pass us and then he jumps off the side of the road and okay in a hurry to stop Cotton Bowl Speedway, all right. Been there a few times. Camped right out in that field. The grips are pretty comfortable on this thing. They uh, kind of remind me of the old uh, balloony grips that some of the Honda touring bikes came with. Uh, there was an aftermarket brand that my dad always put on his touring bikes. I can't remember the name of it, but they were like these uh, pillow air filled grips inside. Kind of remind me of that. They're a little bit narrow from the inner edge to the, the outer shoulder or hip here, but you know, they fit my hands well because I got small hands. But if you put the bar in mirrors on here, then you got to pull those off. I'm not sure about the, the grips. I think the grips could stay, but these ends have to come off and you got to put on uh, bar end adapters. And the only ones from uh, Royal Enfield that I've seen are silver. I wouldn't want to put silver bar ends on here with black mirrors. So I'll have to figure that out. I don't think they come with the bar ends. I'm not sure. mirrors are okay a lot of people say they're just awful they're unusable but uh, I think that might be stretching it a bit they are a little vibey but you can still see through them at least I'm not looking at my shoulders they're spaced out far enough that they're useful but I will be replacing them with something else
it's hot out here. Have I mentioned yet that it's hot? Oh, it's hot. It's like a slow rolling bread oven out here. Thirty-six more miles of this, and then I'll be turning off on another little rural highway. Get off of uh, 290 here. Unfortunately, between uh, the Houston area and Austin, there's not a lot of uh, rural road options that are easily connecting you to the two cities. Uh, you're either on 71 or on 290. There are a handful of little farm to market roads off to the side, but invariably they always lead back to this stretch of 290 if you're on the northern stretch. So might as well just take 290 for a little while. I will jump off as soon as possible though. Get some uh, variance in the engine RPM. Golly, golly, it's hot. Yep, still has the smell. Engine still baking in. It's a different smell, I'll, I'll say that. It's It smells different than any other of my new bikes that I've had. Must be a difference in the uh, paint compound that they use on the uh, cylinder and maybe on the exhaust. It could be, you know, the exhaust packing that's kind of baking in, you know. Wonder what kind of packing is in there, if it's a steel wool or if they're using some kind of fiberglass or what it is. If any batting, it might not have batting in it, it might just be uh, baffles, who knows. And I haven't looked yet to know where the catalyst is on this thing, if it's in a mid-pipe or if it's in the uh, exhaust silencer at the back end. If it's in the silencer, then that makes 
for the muffler portion. That makes replacing the muffler with a slip-on really easy because then you don't have to worry about you know, catalyst restrictions or anything like that. And it has very little impact on the, the state of tune for the engine because you're not changing the airflow characteristics that much. A lot of times when you replace the entire exhaust or if you delete the catalyst, catalytic converter, then uh, it can improve the airflow in the engine so much that you actually run a little bit lean. So. Slip-ons are easy when the uh, catalyst is forward of the pipe, or forward of the exhaust itself. Off. Can't tell if it's better with the shield open or not. Ugh. With it open, it's just a blast furnace to the face. With it closed, it's a little too stuffy. Stand up riding's not too hard on it. Bars are a little low for that, but it can be done.
I'm pretty impressed so far with the crosswind stability on this because you know when big trucks pass by or crosswinds or whatever a lot of bikes tend to get a little bit unstable especially lighter bikes this one has just enough heft at 399 pounds 400 pounds let's just call it that it's not really affected too much by crosswinds you get it gentle pushes but it's not uh, a rapid instability so that's good four more miles of this. Ugh. 290 sucks. That's a pretty significant breeze I'm fighting. It's coming from right this direction. Probably 15 to 18 miles an hour. It's, uh, it's breezy. The bike is doing fine in it though. I can feel it on my torso pushing me, but the bike isn't getting pushed offline, so that's great. Busted oak cellars. Busted. It's broke, man. It's so hot out here, man. I can close all the vents in my helmet, but then the helmet gets so stuffy. But the hot air blowing at my eyeballs through this chin vent is just drying out my eyes. Ouchie. That Honda Accord took a beating. I was going to set my cruise control. <laughs> it's not on there. After that, I need to buy one of those. I don't have any spares. I've put them on all my bikes. I need to grab another uh, Go Cruise uh, little throttle lock there. I need to buy another uh, flat kit, uh, my flat kit that I put together with the Dynaplug carbon ultralight. Uh, bike tool CO2 inflator tool 
digital pressure gauge. I usually pick up the pressure gauges over at Cycle Gear. They got some pretty good ones made by uh, uh, whatever their in-house brand is, Trackside, I think. Uh, pretty reasonably priced, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 bucks for a decent digital gauge. Uh, some nitro gloves, some of the screw-on 16 gram or 25 gram CO2 cartridges. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. A Leatherman or some kind of multi-tool. I put those all in a pouch, and zip it up and stick it under the seat and leave it with the bike. In this case, there's not much room under this seat, so I don't know if my flat kit is gonna live under there or if it's gonna have to live in one of the side covers or, I don't know, I'll find a good spot for it. I wonder if that's what some of the other reviewers have alluded to in their comments on the throttle response of when you let off the throttle, it feels like it hangs a little bit, like between shifts and stuff. I wonder if what they're describing isn't flywheel effect, because this thing does have a heavy flywheel. So every time I upshift or downshift, basically I just leave the throttle closed as I'm re-engaging the clutch real quickly and that rev matches right then and then I roll the throttle in. So it's a little bit of a delayed reaction on returning the throttle, uh, but it's perfectly smooth. I don't really notice any uh, fueling hang uh, like, a, uh, like the computer is slow catching up with the change in throttle position. It's flywheel effect is what I'm feeling on this thing. Oh, hey. I thought about trailering this thing back, but yeah, what's the fun of that? It's hot as hell out here today, but what better way to get used to the bike and become acquainted with it with some uh, nice leisurely uh, break-in miles on the highway. I'd much rather do it in a curvy, twisty, scenic highway than this highway, but you know. put 150 of the 300 break-in miles on it right away. My oil change kit should be arriving in the next few days, I hope. Uh, and that consists of uh, the valve cover gasket, uh, new O-rings for the oil filter over here, of course the oil filter, and the inner oil ring. Uh, and then I think the uh, timing cover, you know, crank, bolt uh, o-ring comes with like three different o-rings so that's the oil change kit it was like 45 bucks for everything so i ordered it why not but i don't remember if that was coming out of india or somewhere else so i don't know i may uh, end up taking this over to the uh, uh, iron power sports their you know, iron supply in katie and have them do the first service that way it's on the warranty card I need to figure out what oil plug fits this thing for a magnetic drain bolt. I'm partial to gold plug because I've used them and I trust them. They're really heavy duty uh, CNC cut billet uh, stainless steel, very heavy duty. And the magnets that they put in there are real strong and they're countersunk and epoxied in, so they're definitely not coming loose. Uh, there are a few brands that I've seen that you know all over ebay that are supposed to be very popular with uh, the little j series engines but i've never heard of the brand so i don't know if i trust them
seems like the specs that I had seen were uh, 12 millimeter by 1.25 thread and the head size on it was a 17 or a 22 or something like that. I'll measure it when I get home, but I'm not going to pull the plug, obviously, until I'm ready to do the oil change because the oil is going to get dumped out. actually pretty easy to stand up and ride. It's compact, it's balanced. The bars just need to be a little bit taller. Yeah, I think I'm going to roll these bars forward a bit because they're definitely pitched backwards. Now I'll just wait to do that until my bar risers come in. I'll put the bar risers on here. Then I'll reset them. Two birds, one stone. I can't count how many hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times I've been up and down this Strix trip 290. Oh my god. I used to drive or ride this, usually road, uh, four to five times a week. Every week for years and years and years and years. Because I lived in Austin and had a, my job most of the time was down here in Houston. It was so much so that I ended up getting an apartment in Houston uh, just so I wouldn't have to go back a few days a week. And, uh, yeah, crazy. Hundreds of thousands of miles I've burned right here on this stretch of road. That was back when I was putting down probably in the neighborhood of 120 to 140,000 miles a year commuting for work. Most of it was done on motorcycles. Uh, I was doing over 10,000 a month consistently. And I had multiple bikes and, you know, a couple cars. So I was trying to spread the miles out, but most of it was done on bikes, bigger bikes. I had uh, touring bikes and, you know, Honda Goldwings and Kawasaki Concours, FJ1100, FJ1200, Kawasaki Voyager in there somewhere. And uh, I was getting about 10,000 to 12,000 miles out of my rear tires. So that was a tire a month. I was in the tire a month club. And if I was spreading it out on multiple bikes, then it would be two rear tires every couple of months. So I ended up just buying, you know, a dozen tires at a time. And <laughs> I would just stock them in my garage. For a while, I was taking it to the, the shop and uh, I was literally rotating my bike out occasionally and I would just leave the bike for two or three weeks with them. They would do the, the tire changes and I would bring the other one in to have it done and take my other bike with me. And I'd be gone on the road for another week or two weeks or whatever. Uh, it's crazy. But I finally got tired of paying all the shop labor for that and the shop changed hands and they didn't like my bike sitting around all the time and they wanted to start charging me daily storage fees. I was like, ah, screw you then. And uh, I ended up getting all the tire changing stuff for myself at home. Tire month. I usually get about 20,000 or so out of my fronts. It's just highway miles, you know, you're not really scrubbing them that much. They'd get scalloped and wear a little funny and start getting noisy, but that was uh, long before the tread wore out. miles
you know, I had all these grand plans of setting up two or three cameras on the bike for this first ride home video, but uh, it's too hot to stand outside and mess with that. There at the dealer, there's just no shade anywhere. The sun is straight up, giant concrete parking lot, no no eaves or overhangs. Uh, no, no thanks, not gonna mess with that. I had a mount that I was gonna put up here off the handlebars to do the uh, 360 camera. Uh, and it doesn't quite fit right, so I wasn't gonna mess with it. Uh, and then I wanted to put one on the back somewhere facing forward off the side of the bike, but there's not a convenient spot that I could find in order to plug a, you know, ram ball bolt or something on there, so now nah, I don't know how to mess with it. I'll leave that for a future ride, maybe the, uh, the second ride review. The finishing the break-in ride review. <laughs> Gonna be plenty of rides with this bike. So we're 82 miles into the trip and uh, still got over a half a tank of indicated uh, fuel there. I'm not sure how linear that fuel gauge is, but we're gonna find out. If it's getting anywhere even close to, let's say 80 miles to the gallon, then that's 240, 250 miles of range. So I should easily be able to get home in one tank. I'll probably stop. Uh, I'm trying to think of which way I'm going. Yeah, I'm going kind of by Bucky's. So I might be able to stop by uh, Bucky's and fill it up with ethanol free before I get home. We'll see. like four big glasses to drink before we left that restaurant back there and I'm already thirsty again. Woo, it's hot out here. I was gonna bring my Geiger rig hydration pack for this, but I haven't rebuilt it since it uh, got run over by that dim wet. Yeah, where was I? I remember where we were. Near Red Rock somewhere uh, on the Cannonball Run. It managed to work its way loose off of my uh, scooter from underneath the straps and some guy on the highway aimed right for it. He changed lanes, aimed for it, ran it over, and then went back to the lane that he was in. So he intentionally center punched that pack. What a jerk. Destroyed it. I, mean, I think the, the backpack portion is okay. It's got some rips in the material, but not structural. It's just uh, cosmetic. So I think it's all right. But I have to replace the uh, squeeze bulb, the bladder, the bike valve is gone, one of the hoses is totally gone, it just, it got ripped to shreds. It would be nice right about now with a bunch of ice cold water in it. Because the heat coming off of this pavement is easily 125, 130 degrees. It's hot out here. Truckers are a little aggressive, aren't they? Speed limit 70, they're running 90 plus, weaving around, flying right up on people without slowing down. So I haven't figured out what my schedule looks like for next week but I might be able to take off for a couple of days and go up to the uh, Scoot the Ozarks event. If I do, I'll take this bike. With or without the accessories, I'll take this bike. I'll just strap a dry bag to the back seat with my camping gear and hit it. But if I do that, I need to get the 300 mile service done first, obviously, because that's gonna be a, a 12 to 1400 mile trip right there. This isn't a uh, scooter by any stretch of the imagination, but eh, small bore, kind of fits, right?
I've never done any research on the climate in India. I know it's a huge country. I wonder if it's as hot there as it is here and how that translates to, you know, how these things are built and their longevity and durability and all that. I wonder. Hello? Hey. I'm on my way back to Katy. I'll be there in about, uh, I don't know, an hour. Uh, not really. Uh, I ate a little bit of lunch. Uh, I'll be okay until dinner. Uh, I found, or I got an email from uh, Fogo de Chão that looks interesting. I'll forward it to you later. Uh, National Caparina Day. That sounds interesting. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. So uh, I didn't really look at the price or whatever, but they're saying, come on in and visit us for National Caipirina Day, blah, blah, blah. And it was, you know, sales on uh, the, the lunch or the dinner menu or something like that. But yeah, we'll have to check that out. That could be fun. What's that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, somebody's going to have to stay with uh, Hope and Bella and whatnot. I mean, I don't know. We'll figure it out. Josh might be interested in going, but we'll see. Uh, but yeah, I'll send you that when I get home. But I should be there in about, uh, I don't know, 45 minutes or an hour. Okay. Love you. Bye. Love you. Bye. The seat is very comfortable. I'm not having any uh, hot spots or pressure points an hour or more into the ride here. But what I will tell you is I'm sweating my butt off. Sweating my butt off. It's hot out here. Uh, so either for this seat or the, uh, you know, the upgraded custom seat that's coming, what I might get are one of those uh, perforated covers. I forget what they call them. They're airflow covers uh, made of that thick honeycomb nylon stuff and they promote airflow and keep water from pooling up on it and all that it's pretty fancy uh they're stretched to fit so they're kind of a universal size you know small medium large whatever uh but they contour to fit the seat i might get one of those i might get one of those that might be pretty cool i don't know how it would look on here but uh something to promote airflow for these hot summer months i'm all for that an air hawk pad i don't think would look great on here because this is a long bench seat uh, I think it would be better to get a full cover that you know kind of blends in with the entire seat as a whole If any of you have those uh, seat covers that I'm talking about, I'll try to put the name in here. There, there's a couple of different brands of them, uh, but I think there are two brands that are really popular. Uh, but it's that, you know, waterproof mesh. You see the ads on Instagram all the time, and uh, I've seen the ads, you know, various pop-ups all over the internet and YouTube and all that. And I'm going to look at those. I don't think they're terribly expensive. They're less than 100 bucks. We are getting out of this lane. I don't know what's going on there, but I'm not waiting in it. 1.9 miles. I ain't waiting in that. Oh.
chug, 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 Just barely ticking over. Oh, it's messing with my noodle, man. It feels like it's gonna die. Oh, God, it's hot. Ah, sweat running down my face into my eyes and my nose. I'm not sniffling snot. Pretty thought, huh? I'm sniffling sweat and tears. I guess I could have taken 36 there. I don't know why Waze is taking me this way, but oh well. We'll trust Waze. I said keep me off of the highways. Ugh, bump. Yeah, big bumps are pretty sharp on that rear suspension. I don't think it's bottoming out, but I'll have to do my uh, zip tie test. Check out the uh, rear compliance and rear travel, find out where it sits. Well, where are you turning, buddy? Left or not, left or not. Oh, there you go, you're doing it. Oh, it is a blowtorch to the face out here. Woo, buddy. I like this transmission, man. It's just super easy, very precise. I haven't had a missed shift yet. Nothing has felt, you know, halfway. It just clicks right in. It's great. Snickety snick little uh, shifts. Yeah, I wonder if uh, the other reviewers that have written this and they were saying that there's a little bit of a throttle hang. I think what they're explaining or misdiagnosing is a flywheel effect because I feel it too. But it's not uh, it's not actually fueling. It's just the the heavy flywheel inertia. Ugh, bump. Uh, I gotta crack this open, get some more airflow. Whew. 106, hotter than that with the heat coming off the pavement. Railroad track, railroad track. Uh, where's the road? There it is. I'm on 36. Cool. Yeah, 36 is a decent little highway. God, I'm thirsty. Sweating out everything I drink. 525 feet, uh, must be up here. Yeah, this is my usual route.
man, that low idle is just tripping me out. I might get used to it after a few years. That is going to take forever to get used to. I mean, it's torquey enough at the bottom end. It doesn't feel like it's going to stall out. But at idle, at tick over, I swear it sounds like it's about to die. If this were a carbureted bike, I'd be reaching in there and bumping that idle up. Like right there, it just feels like it's about to die. This is gonna put us down kind of on the edge of Sealy, if I recall. be adding the uh, Fuelex light computer to this thing, the uh, the fueling computer that's so popular in uh, India and a lot of other places, even in the UK now, I think. Um, it's a fuel auto tuner, so if you do any uh, engine modifications uh, for, you know, intake or exhaust or whatever, uh, it basically just sits there and reads the O2 and uh, kind of tweaks what the computer sees for uh, fuel or O2 values and uh, it enriches the mixture a tiny bit above the Euro 5 spec that it's got right now so it may affect the fuel economy a tiny bit but it's supposed to drastically improve uh, throttle response and everything else and the cool thing is, is it's auto tuning so it's not a fixed map it's, uh, it's a continuous closed loop auto tune so if you add an intake that's one thing that it'll compensate for. If you add an exhaust, it'll compensate for that. If you add intake and exhaust, it'll compensate for that. Uh, and apparently it'll even, it even has enough enrichment in it or the injector's got enough duty cycle uh, to work with uh, performance camshafts and stuff like that as well. So if you don't need all the tunability of the Fuelex Pro, which has 10 different fuel maps that you can cycle through, uh, you just go with the single map and turn it on and let it run. It's kind of what I would want to do. I see no reason to get in there and fiddle with uh, enrichment maps. And that's the, the other thing is they're not really full fuel maps. It's just an enrichment setting. Uh, percentages basically from baseline above or below what it's going to feed the computer. So. Oh, hell, this pavement is hot. So I have the DNA Stage 2 uh, air filter and intake uh, mod, you know, the, the air cover, air inlet, whatever. Uh, that Stage 2 kit is coming. It should be here any time. Uh, that was from a U.S. seller, so I should have that in a few days. Uh, I'm going to complete the break-in miles without making any changes to this thing, obviously. But then I'll probably do that uh, air filter right away because everybody says it really cleans things up. But I won't do that until I have that FuelX computer uh, to uh, help tune things a bit. So I don't want this thing to end up running too lean. Euro 5 is already pretty lean, so you go putting a free-flow exhaust or a cat delete or something like that, you're going to be really lean you can end up with engine damage. Lean is hot, and that's not necessarily a good thing. The engine is always going to make the most power on a slightly lean map, uh, but when you go too lean, then you lose power and you generate a whole lot of heat. And the heat is what is real bad for your valves. Burns out your spark plugs, stuff like that. Extreme cases, you can seize your piston, you know, you know real problems burn a hole in the top of your piston. Come on, dude. Yep, Sealy, Belleville is going to put us right in, uh, going through Belleville, edge of Sealy. Back roads all the way home, right over by Stephen F. Austin Park, where I like to go camping. If it wasn't so friggin' hot, I would have just brought a hammock with me and uh, do a a first ride home and moto camp in one shot, but mm -mm, no, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, nope, yet, nada. Too friggin' hot for that.
So before I do the intake uh, mods on it with the DNA air filter and the Fuel X light, I want to get a couple of good baselines for full tank runs on the back roads like this, 55, 60 miles an hour, and get a good fuel metric. And yes, I know it's still breaking in, so that's gonna improve or get better as time goes on, generally speaking, but that'll give me kind of a baseline map. And then I'll add the DNA filter with the, the intake plate, whatever you wanna call it, and uh, the fuel X and see what that does to the fuel economy, if it's up or down. Uh, and then I'll be working with a couple of different exhaust companies. Uh, I've got one local to me here in Texas that I'm gonna try to set up a meeting and uh, ride up to their place up near the Austin area and uh, see if he wants to have a go at this make a custom exhaust for it uh, and then I really like Kaufman's you guys know how much I love Kaufman's shout out to Kaufman's exhaust in Ukiah California hey guys uh, I'm gonna see if you're interested in finding something that fits this uh, I'll pull the muffler portion the silencer portion off the back of this pipe to get a head pipe diameter and uh, figure out if the existing shorties are going to work or if it's going to be something different uh, it would be really slick if the existing shorty works and in fact i've got a couple of them in my garage that i could use for testing so i'll see if they fit on there if they do i'm just going to put one on there and play with it but again, I want to have that Fuel X uh, light on here to help auto-tune the uh, engine parameters because I don't want this thing to go lean and burn itself up. I'll figure out what the catalyst is in the exhaust, if it's uh, either in the can in the back or if it's in the mid-pipe. Man, I just want to go exploring some of these side roads, see where they go. It's so hot out here, though. Ugh. The other thing I might do to this, it's on my uh, project list, potential upgrades. Uh, if I use this for long distance touring, I have a Scott Oiler vacuum system that's just been sitting in the box new i thought of putting it on the super cub before the cannonball in 21 and just didn't do it so it's still sitting in the box i could rig up that uh, scott oiler on here and put the drip tube back there on the uh, rear sprocket just have an automatic chain oiler and let it go this bike isn't going to be hard to service because it has a center stand but, you know, for the long highway runs, 500, 800, 1,000 miles a day, whatever, it's nice to not have to think about that every 300 miles. The other thing I might do, might, maybe, I might see if one of my uh, sure packs trailer hitches, the hoops, the drawbar portion fits the width of this swing arm. Ooh, traffic is getting worse. There you go. Rerouting. Uh, it might be uh, interesting to pull the little uh, Surepax trailer behind this thing. It's got enough torque. It's a low-speed motorcycle, so you know, shouldn't have any problems with uh, running that trailer too fast and worrying about instability issues or anything like that. So that could be really cool. Have a little bare bones uh, back road tour with a with a trailer. You're welcome. It'd look pretty good behind this thing too. Silver and black. Silver and black. And with as much fuel as this thing has on board, 3.4, 3.5 gallons or whatever, uh, if I also carried some fuel on the, uh, the trailer in the back, oh man, you're talking about a cross country machine right here. Plenty of legs. Oh, 
hope I don't get a flat being nice. At least he said thank you. And yes, it's a courtesy to say thank you if someone is nice enough to scoot over. Because I'm not required to go 70, 75 miles an hour. 55, 60, plenty passable for these rural highways. You don't like it? Take the interstate. That's what these rural highways are for, is just relaxing, taking a scenic drive. They're not meant for blasting ass from point A to point B. Uh, until probably, I think it was around 2015, most of these rural highways out here had speed limits of 55, 60 miles an hour. It wasn't until just pretty recently, within the last decade, I guess, uh, that a lot of the speed limits got raised up to 65 and 70 and 75. And in some areas here in Texas, we've even got 80 and 85 mile an hour highways. Damn! So that just means people are gonna be running 100 miles an hour. <laughs> 10 over or 15 over everywhere all the time, right? Don't want to get a flat. jack off not much of a hurry you're coming up tailgating me just to stop and turn right here dude you're home quit being a dick This engine just has such a pleasant thrum to it, uh, a very calming demeanor, uh, engine note, everything about it, right around 55 to 60 indicated. So I wonder if uh, putting a plus one front sprocket on it would help maintain that same calm demeanor at a little bit higher road speed, you know, 60 to 65, that'd be great. It just sounds so happy right about here, right around 55 to 60 indicated. Just effortless, very relaxed. I like it.
pretty good incline here. I'm not quite full throttle, I'm about three quarter throttle. Gaining in top gear from 56 up to you know, 60 or so pretty easily. About 70% throttle, that's not bad. Against the wind, no less. Not bad for a little 20 horsepower 350. Doing okay. Pretty good headwind today. hot out here. Oh, goodness, it's hot. My butt is a-sweating. Sweaty legs and everything stuck to the seat. The seat's comfortable. I'm just sweaty. Need some airflow. Oh, what she pulled out in front of me. Oh, it's hot. Oh, it's hot. Welcome to Belleville. That doesn't help. The wind in the face is just hot. It's drying out my eyeballs. Got a visitor center there. I'll have to stop there sometime. I didn't realize that. Belleville Visitor Center. Ugh, if I were 10 seconds faster through here, I wouldn't have to stop in the heat. Okay, he's done. Well, 
Okay, I guess we're not going to have to stop for that guy. Seven hundred feet. I'm supposed to go straight. What the? Oh yeah, yeah. It wants me to go on that back road. That's another way to go right there, but it's taking me the back way. That's okay. Oh yeah. Uh, uh. This is a nice twisty back road. I like this one. This takes us over to 359. Uh, right up in here, if I go right, uh, it takes me through the uh, little back roads that lead over to Stephen F. Austin Park. But it's hot right now, and I think I'm going to skip that option. That's the little road right there, I think. Somewhere over here, I don't remember. Yeah, anyway, we're just gonna go this way. 359 will take us home right through Katy and Alt 90. You know, if I were just looking at this landscape and not feeling it right now, I would think that it was winter time out here. Cold, you know, like late fall, early spring. Uh -uh. It's usually so green out here, but it's just dead. If you dropped about 60 degrees off of the temperature right now, this would be how it looks out here in the winter time usually. Speaking of heat, I'm not really noticing any heat coming off of this engine. Uh, I'm sure it's there, but with the ambient temperatures being as high as they are, I'm not really feeling it. So this little single air cooled right here between my legs is not putting off all that much heat. I don't, it's not bothersome, you know, not uh, not noticeable enough to really feel in contrast to the, the heat around me right now. 104, 105, whatever the ambient temperature is, so it's not bad. Now in the winter time, it might be nice to have some of the heat off of that engine, but it seems to be a cool running little thumper. so thirsty. I think I'm going to stop at that big uh, timeout to uh, Exxon, whatever it is up here in a handful of miles. Right off the corner of 359 up here. Ugh, I am thirsty. I need a Gatorade. It is hot out here. Yikes.
Yeah, this makes me feel like I'm riding a slightly more grown-up Super Cub. The low, narrow bars on it and everything. Better seating position than the Super Cub. This is Aaron. Hey Tim, how are you, sir? I have not, but I did log into that account that you sent me and uh, I think that's gonna give me what I need. So I'm on my way back from Austin right now, yeah. So uh, I'll try to get in that this afternoon for you. If not, tomorrow morning, I've got absolutely nothing on the books. So I will put that at the top of my schedule because I know you've been waiting for a few weeks on that so 
that big bill, yeah. You're not using those phone lines, so you might as well, yeah. I was sick uh, for about a week, and I know that you and uh, Kresh were trying to work on your inbound calls. There was something you guys could make calls, but you weren't receiving stuff. What was that? Huh. How strange. I don't know. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I mean, at the very least, we need to forward your main line to something else, your cell phones or something, so if you're not receiving calls. So, yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, I will get in it uh, as soon as I land, and I'll let you know what I find. Okay. Thanks. Bye.
Horns, nothing, you can't even hear it. Oh, I gotta fix that. I haven't even tried the horn on this thing, I just thought about it. Nah, it's, it's a decent tone, but it's way too quiet. Put a Denali sound bomb on this bad boy. One mile, 359. Yep, there's that fuel station. What you do it, dude? I'm going to stop at that uh, fuel station right over there and get a drink. I am parched. Growing some dirt out here. Okay, it's Gatorade time. <sighs> Man, that's a good looking bike. I like it a lot. A lot, a lot. Okay, drink now. Must have. Got a drink. Whew. Ooh, that handle's hot. Good God. Sun shining on it. Oh, big Gatorade. Meeny, meeny, miny, mo. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, better. Body armor. They're, they're not on sale, but I don't care. Three for six. Eh, yeah, maybe I'll do Gatorade. Three for six. Eeny, miny, it's not the zero, is it? I hate that stuff. Oh, that's good. And mo. Oh, I like that one. That's the one I like. I think that's the one I like. Yeah, good enough. Three for six. Done. Mine. Gimme. You want something, Josh? I am so wetting. Three for six. I'm getting three. I'll wait for you to get up here. Mm. Wow. Hot, hot. Goodness. I should just turn my helmet upside down and open the spigot here and just let it fill my helmet. That would be great. I wouldn't mind that at all. Yeah, switch one out for that, sure. Three for six. So. Here. You you ring those out. No, you ring them out. Uh, I'm going to put this one back. Only got about 30 more minutes to get home, but it's uh, 
hot enough that I don't want to endure 30 more minutes. Uh, Donka. I'm barely, I'm still over a half a tank on that thing. Really? Yeah. It just ticked to the half tank mark and it was kind of going back and forth. Holy bejesus, is it hot. Do you feel how hot that handle is? Uh, scalded my hand when I grabbed it. Oh, that's a good looking machine. I like it. Uh, I want the purple one. Purple. Ooh. I don't even know what flavor purple is, but purple look good. Purple is mine. They used to have like a grape. <laughs> grape something. Stay open, you piece of stuff. It's very dark weird. Oh, God. No shade to be found except where it doesn't need to be. Oh God, it's hot. Oh. Ah. How's the brake light and the signals on this? Are they bright enough? Pretty bright, yeah. I've got the LED signals on the way, but the tail light I think is already LED. <laughs> yeah, it is. All the rest of the bulbs are just incandescent, but I got LEDs on the way. Oh, that's so cold, it's giving me brain freeze. Fuck. <sighs> when we get home and it cools off, take it out for a spin. It's great fun. Yeah. It's not a rever, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't spin up fast. It's just a slow, easy going bike. It's kind of like a, a dirt bike, but not a dirt bike, you know, just standard. Like the, one thing. the personality of the engine feels a lot like the XT250, but it's got more torque. Different kind of controls compared to uh, metric bikes, Japanese bikes in general, but they work fine. That's the uh, button to change the display on the computer on the front. Uh, doesn't matter how much I drink, I'm still thirsty. Let's get, it's not getting any colder. Nah, save it for later. 28 fluid ounces, uh, 828 mil, gone, done, bye-bye. <clears throat> Good God, it's hot out here. Have I mentioned that it's hot? Ugh, what is that? Is that us? Yeah. <coughs> oh God. Why is this thing? <coughs> All right. Okay, more sweating. Oh, what do I do with the key? Oh man, what do I do with the key? What do I do with the key, man? Oh, there it is. A diddly hoo ha. <coughs> Wowza. <coughs> okay. All right. Off we go.
Chugga 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 chugga. Even the levers are hot. And the sun's shining on them. Yikesy. <sighs> oh god, it's hot. Oh, sweat dripping into my eyes. Okay. Oh, great groove pavement. Just my favorite for the day. Oh man, it's really groove. Look at this. Oh, I guess it's a good test. Tires are doing okay. I'm dancing around a bit. These are very, very steep, nasty grooves. Oh uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is not good for motorcyclists. This is real bad news for motorcyclists. These are serious grooves here, kids. These are like an inch deep. Man, this sucks. A lot. The shoulder would be smoother because it's a cross hatch instead of this linear nonsense. They just repaved this road a few years ago. Why'd they scrape it up again? Got some federal money they had to waste. Now this sucks balls. Yeah, I would have taken any other road besides this. Oh yeah, this is absolute crap. These tires don't like this much. This road is long. Hopefully this is not the full length of it because this is like 10 miles. Oh yeah, this bike is all over the place on these ruts. That sucks. And I don't dare go any faster than this. I've never ridden a motorcycle on ruts this deep. This is surprising. I mean, these are really deep ruts. I don't know if it comes out on camera, but these are super deep. And like that one in the middle right here that I'm skating next to just left of the tire is probably two, two and a half inches deep. I mean, these are serious ruts. This is crazy. There's a semi riding right up Josh's ass behind us. Tough, dude. This wasn't marked caution for motorcycles. I would have gone a different route. I could have gone several miles back the other way and avoided this completely. Finally getting out of it. Ba bump. Ugh. Ah, there we go. Man, that's dangerous back there. Bicyclists, it would be just almost impossible to ride on because it would drag your tires all over the place and pull it out from underneath you. And this is a pretty popular road with bicyclists, that's why mentioned that this these rural highways out here 359 and then that one that we came in on very popular bicycle route
Yeah.
<laughs> wow, the hell did that guy hit? What is up with this light? Come on, nobody's going. It's just hot.
Dominoes. That looks like a manufacturing plant. Wow. They got all kinds of stuff there. They must actually make the ingredients for Domino's. <laughs> so we should be passing by the new Iron Power Sports or Iron Supply Power Sports uh, location right out here close to uh, Bucky's. Bucky's is right down that road right here, I think. So they said that they were right here on one of the corners leading up to it. <laughs> have to look. No, it's not this one, it's the next one.
Iron Supply Power Sports on the right. <laughs> now that I've got the deal done, I can talk about that money. Uh, Iron Supply wanted almost $1,000 more for this bike. Ouch! Out the door price was like 5,800 and change. I got this for 4,900 and change out the door. Crazy. And they didn't have this color, so it was a moot point. <clears throat> oh, buddy, it's hot. Yeah, I can't decide if I like these levers or don't like them. They're kind of weird feeling to me. I'm just not used to that giant flat profile. I like a little bit more square or rounded profile like uh, most metric bikes have. So I'll probably put some uh, adjustable levers on this thing shorter than these. I need to figure out which ones fit though because these perches are kind of strange the shape of the uh the perch seat and all that so they're obviously going to need to be made to fit these perches they're not you know your typical uh japanese metric type mounting point so if you want over do it now dude okay i guess you don't want over Texas tradition. I had a, several people tell me that that is a fantastic place to eat. They're a little pricey, but uh, great steaks and burgers. I have to go there and try them out. Have a plan before you turn the key, dude. Well, at least I found some shade to hide under. Oh, for the duration of this light. Horn is pathetic.
who next? That brake line looks funny. Other people have mentioned it. I have to concur. I think they could have gone around the uh, the headstock here and then back across the underside of the triple tree and gotten a straighter shot at the caliper and it wouldn't be as visible. Sounds like crap. There it is. Hot. Hot. Friggin' hot. Oh, it's friggin' hot. I still have some work I need to get done today. It's uh, it's 5.15 right now. I still have to get to uh, my warehouse. It's going to be a very late night for me. I think I will go in the comfort of an air-conditioned vehicle, though, because it's just too hot and I've had enough today.
Wow, it's the Thorazine Parade today. Oh, yeah, I'm ready to get out of this heat. Quite enough today.
All right, so back in my neighborhood, 150.6 miles on the clicker. So it's, you know, 142, 143 mile trip home, roughly. It had seven something miles on it when I picked it up. So pretty good uh, first break-in ride. I tried to keep the speeds below 60-ish and didn't, uh, didn't really rev it up too much. Uh, tried to vary my speed a little bit. It's a lot of long highway slog, so. Uh, I was maintaining about 50 to 55 on average and uh, dropping from fifth to fourth and holding a speed, you know, just to raise and lower the RPM a bit. So it's not just sitting there droning along at a fixed RPM all that time. Taking it easy on it and uh, it's done the trip in two thirds of a tank of fuel it looks like. Or I don't know how many dots there are, but I've got at least a quarter tank, probably half a tank left. Uh, I won't know until I fill it up to find out exactly how linear that gauge is. Uh, but yeah, it has done well. I didn't really notice any heat from it, uh, except for right back there when I stopped at that light. I could feel heat coming off the engine back there. But it wasn't obnoxious. I can just tell that it was there. And I'm ready to uh, cool off. Uh, I do have to go to my warehouse and ship something out that should have gone out yesterday, but my yesterday was filled with uh, selling the Riker and today picking this up. So I've had two down days now and I've got to get something shipped for an eBay order. Now, technically you've got what is it, four or five working days or something to ship them, but I already printed the label. I want to get it out, get it done. They've paid me, so I want to make sure that it uh, gets out. Got a constable here, don't know what's going on. Sheriff, whatever. All right, so home again, home again. This time on a new bike try to put this uh, video in the cooker and chop it up and give some kind of a semi-concise uh, first ride video, owner's review, first ride, first impression, whatever. Uh, and then I'll put some more camera mounts on this thing and go out and do a proper uh, second ride uh, review and show everybody what it's all about. And where's the truck? Oh, the truck is still at the... <laughs> it's at Christian Brothers. I got to pick it up. Anyway, I will catch you all later. Thanks for joining, and I'll see you uh, for the next installment. 151.6 on the clicker. Ugh. Huh? Did you pee? You're all wet. Yeah, wet. 106 out there.